Okay. So, yeah, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for kindly agreeing me to change the program completely. And uh, yes, and I would also like to say that uh, plenty of people who have talked about this issue, thought about these issues uh, very seriously for a very long time, and I'm not one of those. So I really tried in the last days to read up as much as possible to gather feedback and just to try to contribute whatever I could, uh, because I also feel that uh, as yes, this uh, that maybe we can really try to to um, use the momentum that there is at the moment to really try to to push forward some initiatives and try to change something uh, within, within our community at least and so the sorry oops sorry okay so the schedule is so yes first i will just give um, an introduction an overview of the type of let's say problems that i've talked about or issues and then also uh, talk about some potential initiatives and then uh, Jade Master will uh, talk about her own experience in setting up um, an online research community for minorities in applied category theory. Uh, Brendan Fong will talk about, um, um, yes, about trying to, um, to write a statement of values, what values we stand for in the ACT community, and he will talk more about this. Emily Real will share two personal experiences and then uh, finally christian williams will give uh, an overview of the act server because uh, that will probably be also be a, a big part of the let's say infrastructure that we will need to push forward this discussion and also some initiatives so yes yeah, so first of all in the title i have these two words one is values and the other is uh, inclusivity so i would like to maybe so we'll not say much about values because this is something that was actually brought to my attention by brendan fong and um, and so yes he will talk more about this and so what i will talk about here is inclusivity even though yes what values we stand for i think lies underneath whatever we do in terms of inclusivity and initiatives that we want to push forward and so yes inclusivity have been very vague in the abstract and um so yes while on one hand we have let's say widespread problem of inclusivity in our community and of course in also in many other mathematical communities and I think we really can and should use this opportunity to fight for inclusivity for all underrepresented groups. There is also a difference in the systemic violence and discrimination that black people face. And so I think we really need to um, specifically address this racism. And uh, one fight does not exclude the other. On the contrary, I think they can reinforce themselves. But I think we really need to make a clear distinction in that sense. And I think the current events also, that they're really also uh, showing this. And so I would like now to share um, a quote that Marisa Loving um, shared to a Facebook um, group for women in geometry and topology world yesterday. And I asked her for permission to share this. And so I'm going to read it. Um, As women in math, we have likely all experienced marginalization in our research communities to some extent or another. But this pales in comparison to the sustained systemic violence experienced by black people in the US. I don't have any new solutions or ideas about how we can address racism in math, but in the past few days it has been particularly frustrating to see senior white mathematicians react to this situation as though it's completely outside of their sphere of influence. In fact, nearly all of them have the status, power and economic means to affect change not only in their immediate physical community, but also in their departments where often white supremacy is at work with very little obstruction and students of color are actively being pushed out of mathematics. We also have the ability to affect change in our departments. I hope that we can use this time to reflect on the way that our privilege allows us to ignore these issues on a daily basis and use the power we have to provide support and advocate for our POC and especially black students and colleagues. So to me, this was very powerful how she expressed this and um, so yes that's why i wanted to to share with you and so uh, what can we do so i think yes she expressed this really well we have to use our privilege even just the fact that we're here today we can take this time we have the energy to focus and just discuss these problems this uh, is because we're privileged because we are not the moment worried for our own safety we don't have to fight for our lives and our safety so we really need to use um, our privilege. And, um, and yes, and this is, I think this is a constant process, even just becoming aware of one's privilege. This is a constant self-education that we need to, to do. 
And so on one hand, I think we really need to edu educate ourselves and share all the sources and references. On the other hand, we need to establish a dialogue uh, there are several uh, communities of the mathematics uh, that uh, advocate for, um, for, for yes, black students, and these are usually led by black mathematicians. So, for example, one that comes to mind is the network Mathematically Gifted and Black. And, uh, and talk to those people and ask what we can do and also ask for feedback. Um, and so, yes, in a constant exchange between us educating ourselves and then establishing this dialogue. And another thing is, of course, it doesn't make sense to reinvent the wheel. There are lots of organizations and efforts in other communities that have been very successful. And I believe also in this uh, workshop uh, that was organized by John Bias at UCR, uh, sadly I was not able to be there, but I believe that people might have talked about several such uh, efforts and organizations. And one that was brought to my attention is the Mathematical and Theoretical Biology Institute. There is a very nice article about this, and I'm also going to, well, Yes, to share it afterwards if we decide on how to share resources. And um, uh, this, is a, this is an institute that um, whose main goal is to mentor through uh, research. And uh, it mentors at all different stages of, uh, let's say, academic life, really from high school through uh, faculty. And uh, it has been extremely successful in changing the um, in, in bringing lots of um, students from underrepresented communities into uh, mathematical biology. And also I think the important thing is also those students, they did not actually fit the typical um, uh, profile of successful, potential successful graduate students, because often they did not have perfect uh, GPAs or um, did not come from elite schools and so on. Um, and so, yes, so for, for example, I think uh, uh, Itre Gons, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong, who is a professor of mathematics at Panoma. I think he's in, he was also involved with uh, this workshop at UCR and somebody told me that, yes, that he's also involved with this, was involved with this institute and he would, for example, be a good person to contact and ask for advice and feedback. Uh, yes? Somebody? No. Okay. Um, so I think, yeah, so some issues that we need to consider is, I think one crucial point is um, how do we go beyond, uh, how do we reach out to people we don't interact with? Um, so for example, if one goes to conferences, one usually sees always the same faces. And on one hand, I think this is very important to build community, but on the other hand, it's also difficult for outsiders to get in. Or we had also these discussions often when we were advertising the ACT school, uh, how do we advertise it? Uh, we, we have our usual channels, but then we will not actually reach out to, to people from minorities. And, uh, and so this also is, is uh, tied in with the next point. I have always been very, um, so yes, for me, positive discrimination is not personally. I don't find it a good policy. And I remember that first year we ran the ACT school, I remember I had said to Brendan and Josh um, that I did not want you to use positive discrimination to evaluate the applications. And I don't think it's a good policy because, uh, well, myself as a woman is, I often ask myself, am I invited to things just because I'm a woman? Do I get things just because I'm a woman? And uh, if one comes from an, um, from a, uh, let's say, underprivileged background and already has to fight harder to do things and already is held in some sense to a higher standard, then uh, if one and already has self doubts, then adding these doubts on top is can be very uh, uh, difficult to deal with. And also, then there is discrimination also from other people who say, oh, that person just got that position because that person fits the, let's say, ticks the box that the university needed to tick. And so from that point of view, it's, I think it's, this can actually be damaging in the long term. But on the other hand, I also think positive discrimination is a solution that one adopts uh, because one hasn't done properly one's homework. Because there are um, people from minorities doing the type of maybe research that one is looking for, it's just that one doesn't know them. And so I think this goes back to the first point is we need to go to reach out to people we usually don't interact with. We need to sit down and make a list of potential people to invite or or yes, so for the school, we need to advertise it in such a way that they are actually reaching the minorities that you would like to have in the school. And uh, yes, another issue is, um, well, if one comes from an underprivileged background, then one has just inherently more, it's just more difficult to access 
um, to resources, to travel, uh, one has maybe financial problems and so on. And these are, there are concrete problems that we need to take into account because it's not just enough to say, well, we, we want to have, I don't know, half of participants from a certain background. Well, if they can't even uh, come to the things we're organizing or access those, well, what's the point? And, uh, and so, for example, in a remote uh, working or learning environment, some specific uh, issues could be the scheduling times. Uh, who has uh, people who have children, they in the evening or a certain time, for example, 5 p.m. and so on, would just be very difficult times for them to take part into, uh, to, into activities. And another is uh, access to Wi-Fi or having tablets and other resources uh, like this. Um, so yes, yeah, so some initiatives uh, that I would like to suggest and then we could maybe then discuss more uh, afterwards is one is having a mentoring scheme and so I think this is one of the very important parts in this um, that made this Mathematical and Theoretical Biology Institute a success, that is network of uh, mentorships and they would mentor at all stages of the academic um, life and for example they would have graduate students mentoring undergrads but the graduate students themselves were mentored by senior faculty in the mentoring process. Or then, uh, well, then the alumni of uh, maybe an undergraduate research program, they would then be uh, mentored at some point also when they were going through trying to apply for uh, tenure track jobs and so on. So they really had this, uh, this very tight uh, mentoring scheme. And uh, yeah, so this seems to be very important, seems to have been a very important part in the success of this um, institute. Another, and I'm going to talk more in detail about this in the next slide, is to um, to take uh, the, to to have um, to create or um, to change the, the existing ACT at John School and to address it to minorities. To really try to use this school that I think has been successful in bringing uh, young researchers from outside the community into the community, to let's say exploit its power even more to to address some of these issues. Um, another initiative, and Jade Master will talk also about her experiences in this, is um, to have yes, establish some online um, research communities uh, for underrepresented groups. And I actually think all these points are all um, tied together. For example, this online research community could help uh, with the mentoring scheme because there one could have, have graduate students who mentor undergrads and so on in the learning process and so on. And uh, finally, yes, I think what is important is that I think this is a process and um, to help us through this process, we need to have appropriate infrastructure to have uh, discussions about these issues, to gather resources and feedback. And so this ties them back with what uh, Christian will talk about also, how maybe we can change the, the existing uh, server, uh, how we need to adapt it to make it more inclusive um, and so on. And uh, so yes, just I would li just like to maybe share some thoughts I have on how to, to have the research school but for minorities and this, so the first point was actually brought to my attention by Brendan. We could maybe take the existing school and make it more inclusive, but in a very, let's say, formal way in the sense that, for example, we could say half of the spots, they are for, from, for students from certain minority groups. And, uh, and as I had already said, for me there, it's really important that we do not um, use positive discrimination. Well, and to be able to not do that, we really need to go out of our way to advertise the school to those minority students. And I think, again, this also comes back to having, establishing a certain dialogue with people from minority groups and so that we actually have the contacts, we know who to reach out for, uh, to, uh, to do the advertisement and so on. Um, and another idea is, well, now with the current pandemic, everything is remote. And I think having the school being remote could help, uh, yes, with some access barriers, right, for people who have disabilities or people who have financial problems. Uh, also, just in terms of funding, funding would be easier because I think that was, is also something that was mentioned earlier by Paolo Perone on the, on the server. Um, but if we make it fully remote, we still need to address the other access barriers, that the, the ones, some of those I had listed before. So for example, the scheduling times um, and the access to Wi-Fi and so on. And, uh, and then yes, so, and then we could get funding to actually support the students, even if they're staying in the rooms and are participating in the schools, to for example, even just pay for childcare so that they can take a couple of hours out of their day to, to 
dedicate themselves to the school or to buy tablets or to have better access to Wi-Fi and so on. And uh, so yes, so this is just, just some thoughts I have about this. And of course, this is, uh, we need to discuss this more. And uh, so yes, this I would now um, hope that we can discuss this in the second part of the discussion. And uh, now, yes, I would, um, this is all I, I wanted to say for the moment. And now I would hand on uh, the work to Jade uh, Master, who will talk about her experience in setting up an online research community for minorities. Hi, thank you, Nina. <coughs> Let me just share my screen. I have some slides as well. Now you get to watch me struggle <laughs> with technology. Um, okay. Yeah, so I, um, around March, I started a, a research community. Uh, Excuse me, I see the Zoom group chat right smack dab in the middle of uh, the slides. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, how about now? Good, now. Um, yeah, so around March when the pandemic first started, I started this uh, research community for minorities in applying category theory, and I'm going to talk about that quickly through these slides and how it went and what I learned, basically. So what happened was uh, I, I knew lots of trans people that applied to the regular school that Nina is talking about. Um, and none of them got in, <laughs> pretty much. I knew, I knew 10 and I encouraged lots of them to apply. Um, and the reason they seemed to not get in, get in was pretty much because they didn't have the right sort of academic credentials. Many of them were professionals, people working as software engineers or people working as regular engineers or in other jobs, people who just didn't go to as pre prestigious enough schools, um, things like that. And I don't really think the reason why they don't have those credentials isn't because of merit, it's because of institutional things. Um, and also the other thing I realized is that uh, it's not just trans people that this probably happened to I think it was happened to lots of underrepresented groups in math. Um, it's just that this is the community that I am closest to and so I'm most aware of. Um, but anyway, I was sort of frustrated by this and I realized that as everything was starting to become online, there was nothing really stopping me from doing my own thing. So I just sort of charged in and did it <laughs> without and, and this was sort of a, a kind of a leap for me, I guess, because I'm still a graduate student. I've never done something like this before. I never really organized something like this before. And I didn't really know what scale it would be at or what would happen. But it was definitely a good experience. Um, so yeah, so I called it uh, MAT, which stands for Minorities in Applied Category Theory. And the purpose was what I wrote here and also on the website, which I can show people, um, to help minorities in applied category theory gain research experience and connection, connections um, to maybe the more prestigious aspects of the applied category theory community. And really just do whatever I can to remove barriers to entry into the more prestigious academic um, area and also barriers to entry into Applied category theory and professional work doing applied category theory. And that includes being a graduate student or a postdoc. I um, mean, I had some, a few principles um, that I wanted to run this school by. I thought about this for a bit. Um, probably the first one I wrote here is the most controversial. I, I don't think it should be merit based, um, mostly because the merit system is pretty broken, I think, and we really want to, to do something which, which disrupts the status quo sufficiently. Um, we're going to need to throw out the merit system and, and not really evaluate people based on that. <laughs> you know, not pe evaluate people based on prestigious schools they went to or, or things, things like that, or prestigious programs they participated in in the past. We really want to get um, a diverse um, applicants and applicant pool of people who actually, I think, really need this help rather than people who maybe would be successful without it. Um, 
Um, another principle that I wanted to run this with was that I wanted people to develop organization skills as well as research skills. Um, I think organization is probably a very large part of doing research that people don't really teach that much, but it is very important. And if you can organize people properly to get the right ideas together, then you can really get a lot done. So I wanted to give people the opportunity to do that organization themselves. Um, and on the application form, what I did was I also solicited um, projects um, that people wanted to lead, solicited for people wanting to lead projects of their own, as well as participating in projects or participating in reading groups. Um, and the last principle that I wanted to have for this community um, was that I didn't really want to gatekeep as much as I possibly could. I mean, if people uh, decided, like some people applying um, based on sort of a misunderstanding of what I meant by minority, and I think it was pretty clear that it was a misunderstanding, but if there's any sort of doubt in my mind about it, I think it's not really my position to decide who should be in this community. Um, so I, I tried to sort of take a step back there. Oh, and one more which didn't fit on the slide. I made these slides uh, this morning before this talk and maybe half an hour. So if there's lots of typos and uh, roughness, this is all very last minute. Um, but the last principle I wanted to um, do was to include um, people with all types of uh, backgrounds. So like people, professional people who are already professors, um, people who are maybe undergraduates, people in all sort of different areas. And the reason I wanted to do this is because um, I think that people with more experience and more privilege could use that privilege to help the people who don't have it yet. And really just having this diverse pool of skills would be really helpful in a research community, I think. So here's the structure that I thought up. Um, I wanted to do some sort of small scale research projects with, with blog posts or codes that would be produced at the end. I wanted these projects to last maybe a couple months. Um, I solicited project leaders and participants. And the idea is we would do some, we did weekly Zoom meetings and also made a Discord where we had discussions and worked on the research projects. For each group, we would do a weekly Zoom meeting. Um, about 20 people applied uh, and lots of people dropped out. So that was the structure. Um, and here's how it went. <laughs> It's like the punchline, I guess, probably. So I started this in March and uh, like probably lots of other academics, I sort of overestimated my capabilities. I really um, thought like, wow, everything is canceled. <laughs> now I can work on my own projects, which is probably what lots of academics thought, but obviously it didn't really work that way as many of you have learned. Um, and I tried to lead three research groups and two reading groups um, all by myself, as well as being the main sort of organizing force for the school as a whole. And uh, I couldn't do it. I had too many responsibilities. Um, and it wasn't only me who couldn't do it. There are lots of other people who are struggling with uh, various economic and various difficulties also related to the pandemic who couldn't make it. Um, so a lot of people, yeah, so a lot of people didn't make it and um, like I said, about 20, 20 people applied at first. Um, lots of people emailed me so they can do it. We ended up with uh, still people in the groups, maybe two or three people showing up to the meetings. And it was a lot of fun, got a lot of research and learning. We didn't get any deliverables. <laughs> okay, anyway, I'll stop rambling about this. Okay, so things that I would do differently and things that I want to do differently if I were to restart this. Um, the first one is to get more help. Um, in particular, I'd like to get more help from, from people who are from a different uh, background from me, um, both sort of academically and in terms of uh, community status. Um, I think that would really help if I had more perspectives on, on who was interested and what, how these things should work. Um, next thing I would like to do is get funding. Uh, I think like if we could pay people for the valuable work that they do at this research community, then it would really 
help people join it to have other jobs, <laughs> which I think is a really important um, type of person to get involved in this. Um, people who are already in academia, um, I think already being in academia requires a certain level of privilege and I'd like to try to reach beyond that. Um, and also I think probably I should have had a bit more structure and maybe learned a bit more from UCT school. Um, and that's all I got. Thanks for listening. Here's a picture of some rocks in the sky. Um, so I think who's next? Who's next? Are we going to do questions? I'm next on the schedule, but sure. And I'm happy to start. Okay. We could have a few questions between two talks mm -hmm. if you want. If there's any questions, I guess maybe no one wants to say anything. Let, let's move on and have lots of questions at the end for unless someone wants. Okay. So go ahead. Um, well, Thanks. I'm, I'm so encouraged to see what 77 people here by my count. Um, and I'd, I'd like to thank Nina just for having the courage to, to do this, to, to take a seminar slot and convert it into a discussion like this, which I think is so valuable and so important at this point in time. Um, yeah, Nina and I were, were talking sort of earlier this week and, um, but also earlier this week um, and, and through the past week, there's been a lot of discussion amongst some of us involved in um, in running AC2 2020. So oh, next month, that's conference. Sorry. Yeah. Hi. That's good to see you, Tom. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> I think you're, you're not muted, if that matters to you. Um, anyway. And, um, and a discussion came up over over the sponsors that had been lined up and whether that was really in line with the values that this community wants to, to endorse um, and also how it, how it might affect the community moving forward. Um, and so sort of in light of that discussion, uh, I thought it would be good, um, many of us thought it would be good to create some sort of community forum um, just to reflect on, on sort of this community, what we're doing and, and what values we have. Um, and perhaps try and produce some sort of statement of values or some sort of professional code, if you like, a Hi Hippocratic Oath for our community, maybe, um, to, to sort of try and capture this um, and to provide some sort of um, flag, say. And so uh, this discussion is, is still very raw, and I hope you'll forgive the rawness, but view it as an opportunity to sort of uh, an invitation to sort of share and participate in this discussion and help shape uh, what, what we produce. Um, so to start, I thought it might be good just to, to zoom out a bit um, and talk about sort of what, what this community, um, at least to me, is about. Um, I, I should say that this talk is mostly, I, I don't um, want to present some sort of notion of, of the values that I think our community has, or I'm sure, although I'm sure my sort of personal perspective will leak through. But I sort of just want to motivate why I think uh, it might be a good idea to, to try and create one. And if people are, are interested in, in doing this together, next steps. Um, so this is an applied category theory seminar, and I'm sort of, I'm sort of speaking as, as a sort of member of that, of that community. Um, and to me, the, the central part of that community, the central rallying point is in the name. Uh, we believe, we're here because we believe category theory can be used to model the real world. And this means it can be used to, we hope, solve, um, to, to push the frontiers of science, to, to model the world in new ways, to produce new technologies um, based on this new understanding. Um, and to me, it's an understanding about the nature of networks, relationships, interconnection, translation, um, things that are, I think, incredibly thrilling to have a formal language for, and that I think will be incredibly, are incredibly powerful and will be increasingly powerful um, in, as our research program and our sort of technology pro building program advances. And so 
it's it's at once about I'm sure we're all many of us are drawn by the sort of the beauty of the mathematics, but there is also a sense of, of impact um, that that is part of this community. And I think one of the things sort of beyond that that I really appreciate about this community is its, its soul, its culture. Um, so led especially for me by by people like John Byers who drew me into this community. Um, we are a community I think that really wants this impact that our work has to be positive on the world. Um, so uh, we hope that, or I hope that I'm contributing to a, a body of knowledge um, whose sort of understanding of networks will help us uh, in some small way contribute to addressing the, 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 the present ecological crisis, or that one day might help us think about pandemics, or that the work we do on formal verification will help us build sort of safer technologies, safer, um, I don't know, air spaces or um, autonomous vehicle systems. Um, and, and I think not only does this come through in sort of what the community writes about, but it comes through in our actions like, um, like this our joint school that, that Nina um, and, and Jade have discussed um, and, and Jade's, Jade's initiative over the past couple of months. Um, indeed, I, I sort of, as a side remark, I'd like to, to thank Emily um, who sort of the, 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 the sort of lineage of that school goes back to these Khan extension seminars um, in the sort of pure side of the category theory community. Um, and so, so a community, I think that once that is doing work that can have an impact and wants that impact to be positive. And I think over the, the past week or so, um, something that came to a head was something we've heard a lot about so far, which is the, the role of funding in sustaining this community and allowing us to, to make it inclusive and to carry out the sort of project that we want. Because any community, and, and particularly one I think that, like ours, is um, I think in a stage of growth. Um, I'm sort of, again, so pleased to see so many people here. It, it needs resources and it sort of is looking for, um, for those resources. Um, and I think, it's, it's amazing to me that um, there is so much interest. I think we should be proud uh, because of the success of our scientific agenda um, and because of the way we've been able to be inclusive and communicate it, that, that many people are interested in, it seems, funding our research. Um, so uh, companies that have come up are, are companies like Google, for example, well, there's the government, there's places like Google, tech companies, um, there are finance companies and um, there also have been companies involved in sort of um, military purposes. Um, so in particular, um, companies that, that make a lot of their revenue through arms, ma arms manufacture and the sale of arms. And I think there are important questions about uh, our role in associating with these companies and whether it sort of compromises what values we might have as a community. Um, whether because we lend sort of legitimacy and credence by interacting with them, or because uh, that sort of interaction gives them access to our, our knowledge and influence over the direction that our research takes. Um, so, so I think there's a tension here and I think it would be good for us to try and sort of move to, to resolving it um, partly as a community by trying to draw out uh, more explicitly uh, what the values that our community holds, what, what we can sort of adhere to, um, to, to guide these questions like who, not only who can sponsor our community conferences or who, how should we decide maybe as individuals who should sponsor our research, um, but also questions like what are we aiming for when we aim for a more inclusive school? Um, and what do, we, what do we mean when we say we want to increase minority participation and why? Um, so, um, again, I, I don't want to, to say um, too much personally at this point. Um, it's still a very new discussion. I think a good place to start, um, a good example of the sort of thing that we've been thinking about uh, that has come up is, for example, Eugenia Cheng's uh, Manifesto for Inclusivity in Category Theory. Um, so here, 
uh, so, some principles that I, I think many of us believe in and many of us have signed on to. Um, and I think we could do a better, uh, we could um, work to, to expand this to, to think about more issues such as, as funding and sponsorship. Um, I want to, to, to close, um, or just briefly before I close, I want to sort of bring back this to this discussion about inclusivity. Um, and I think for me, um, through this belief that, that category theory can impact the world, it means that, that the work we do and the people that are part of it matters. Um, we, not only do we come from our own places of um, some of us privilege and otherwise um, in, in our personal lives, but the participation in this community for me is a privilege. Um, it's access to a body of knowledge that I think, um, and a, a, a great group of people that I think um, honestly is a privilege. Um, and we, um, and as we sort of think about who has access to this knowledge and who um, teaches it, who, how we teach it, who has the ability, um, the voice in contributing to shaping the research directions, to shaping the sort of, I think, values that we encode in our mathematics. Um, I think it's incredibly important that we are an inclusive community um, because as we seek to impact, or if we seek to impact, the world. Um, for me, it's important that sort of the, the lived experiences of the people that are part of this knowledge and who hold this privilege uh, reflect the lived experiences of the people that may be impacted by it. Um, so I think this is an incredibly important part of sort of making sure we have a community that can perform this sort of or speak to this value of producing work that positively impacts the world. And I help, think helps resolve questions or provide the proper voices to answer questions like who should be sponsoring our work. Um, so this, as I said, is a very new, uh, well, this, this is the beginning, I hope, of a discussion. Um, and in terms of next steps, I think um, three things sort of stand out to me as suggestions for now. Uh, one is that I hope this discussion um, takes place as a community. And so we'll have, uh, I hope, some time to discuss today, more time to discuss on the Zulip chat um, that's been already linked over the next few weeks. And then at the Applied Category Theory Conference, um, I hope for sort of more community discussion. Um, I hope also we have sort of conversations amongst ourselves um, and reflect sort of in, in, as individuals or in small groups on this topic. Um, and thirdly, I, um, I hope we do sort of move towards producing some sort of uh, statement. And I would like, I hope to be a part of that and I would like help listening to people and um, bringing that together. So um, I encourage you to, to listen and also to, to reach out to me. Um, I'd love to speak to, to any of you. Um, and I'd love to listen and to, to hear your thoughts and have people help participate in bringing the community together in this way. Um, so, so that's it from me, um, but I'm very, very interested in all your thoughts. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, it was, yes, very nice. Um, I really like the way you expressed yes, many of these things. So I would say, yes, let's reserve the discussion and questions to the end. And I think next is uh, Emily who will share some experiences. Great, thanks very much, Nina. I really appreciate this. And it's uh, nice to have an opportunity to virtually meet uh, more members of the Applied Category Theory group. I've been uh, excitedly watching all the activity in recent years, and I think it's super cool. Um, so I just wanted to briefly share two personal anecdotes, which um, might provide some useful perspectives. Um, so the, the first is uh, from the point of view of a participant. Um, in June uh, 2016, I was attending a workshop on higher structures at the Matrix Institute, which is in the forest kind of outside Melbourne. Uh, it's in a really rural part of the country. There were kangaroos in the woods. It was pretty cool. Um, 
And uh, so it was a two week workshop and actually I stepped away um, in the middle to go to Sydney for a weekend. And I was, I was glad I had because that was the weekend that the Pulse shooting occurred at a, this was a sh uh, one of the sort of horrific mass shootings we've uh, faced in the US in recent years. Um, 49 people were killed at a gay nightclub in Orlando, Florida. Um, the shooting was um, almost certainly racially motivated. It was Latin night and it seemed that the perpetrator was sort of aware of, um, of that particular demographic that would be at this nightclub. Um, um, I was really grateful um, when this incident occurred that I was, um, I'm sorry, grateful of course is the wrong word, but I was, uh, I was feeling relieved that I was uh, away from the conference. It, you know, this is one of those workshops where everybody's living in the same dorms and, you know, you take all your meals with the other participants. There's sort of no place to go and get away um, because I was feeling uh, very isolated in that moment. Um, uh, and, um, you know, not again, um, you know, not again because I'm a queer person of color, but because I'm queer and I'm very familiar with sort of how joyous that sort of space is and um, how it's really a sort of center of community. And um, in a way, it, it was it was really interesting in the, the way that this mass shooting affected me that other mass shootings had not. I mean, all, all of them are equally horrific, but um, somehow it felt sort of more like a personal attack. Um, so um, I went back for the second week of the workshop. This was maybe uh, 24 hours later. And um, what was really interesting to me, again, about that is I felt like I had had this really profound, um, really dramatic experience that weekend. And of course, nothing had happened to me personally at all. Um, and uh, my perception is, uh, you know, for everyone else who was at this workshop, um, it was as if nothing had occurred. You know, we discussed the same mathematics that we had discussed the week before, um, the same conversations uh, continued, you know, but of, of course, my sort of emotions, my focus were completely elsewhere. Um, so I just, I wanted to offer, I mean, I should say, you know, there's, this is not, this anecdote's not meant in any way to equate the experiences of LGBTQ people with um, people of color. Um, you know, of, of course, those experiences vary dramatically depending on where you're based around the world. But, you know, certainly as a, you know, relatively young person in the U.S., I haven't um, faced, uh, you know, I've had relatively few incidences of discrimination, you know, um, relatively few times when I felt personally unsafe or anything like that. But um, even so, um, just having something like this in the news kind of really sort of took me out of the, the research community and, and uh, reminded me of a feeling that, frankly, I feel at most workshops, which is that I'm not entirely among my people. Um, and uh, you know, I, I've been thinking, um, you know, what, what would have been helpful to me at that time, uh, and I think this is part of the motivation that Nina and others are feeling now, is for somebody to sort of acknowledge that something had happened and to sort of notice that something was going on and um, sort of expect that, uh, you know, I might not be as sharp as I was, was the week before. Um, you know, I, I think a privilege is um, being able to turn off the news and, you know, get down to work and, you know, write the, write the paper that's in your, your backlog and, um, you know, it, but, and not be able to emotionally disconnect from some of what's going on in the world. Uh, so the other thing I wanted to share was uh, from the perspective of an educator, I, you know, many of us have an opportunity or will have an opportunity at some point to be in front of the classroom. And I think it's important to think about what we can do to make our classroom spaces more inclusive. Um, so I want to describe what I do when I'm teaching a a large uh, multivariable calculus course. This is in, um, the first time I did this was in fall 2016 at Johns Hopkins. So this is a 350 person lecture. It's a very impersonal environment. I won't get to learn very many students' names. Um, so uh, on the first day, um, I uh, like to uh, sort of give a, a little presentation. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. yes. Great. Thanks. Uh, I, well, sorry. Now this is on the. <laughs> 
So um, I start with this XKCD comic uh, um, and uh, use this as an opportunity. I mean, so <laughs> I, I use this as an opportunity to kind of make an in-joke about how mathematics is, um, you know, different from other disciplines and that, um, you know, we have a sort of more clear sense of uh, right ideas and wrong ideas. Of course, all of us know that the, the truth at the research level is considerably more nuanced, but you know, for, for calculus students, there are generally correct answers to an integral or, or not. And so, you know, I, I, I use this uh, com or this illustration as an opportunity to invite students to correct me when I say things that are wrong um, and say, you know, I'm certainly going to make mistakes. I probably will on the first day. I don't do it deliberately, but I, you know, I don't have to. It almost certainly happens <laughs> invariably. Um, but to point out that there's sort of a nice way to say, tell somebody that they're incorrect and there's a, there's a not so nice way. And so this, I mean, the, whoever is saying this is clearly an asshole. Uh, you know, I'll, I also make a, a point that the person who's holding the chalk, who's trying to compute the integral is the one who's learning something in this situation. He's having a constructive experience. And if, um, you know, and that's something that's worth emulating um, as long as we can uh, get the rest of the class culture to not be jerks about pointing out, out the mistakes that almost inevitably occur. Um, so this is really a two panel comic many of you have seen before and this is the, the second panel and what I'm pointing out is that it's a lot harder for certain people to speak up in class. So if once we've centered the idea that you know a way to learn something is by doing, to, by trying to answer a question by, um, you know, sort of putting yourself in the position to answer or ask a question. Of course, if you feel like you're representing a minoritized group, then um, there, that's a, there's a lot more pressure in that scenario, or, you know, some people can benefit from an anonymity in a way that others cannot. Um, so this is the XKCD comic. I think it's called How It Works, if you want to look it up. Uh, so then another thing that I um, try to talk about are sort of stereotypes, and I ask uh, you know, I ask people, um, uh, you know, so sort of what sort of professional does this look like to you? Um, you know, does this look like somebody who's an, as an athlete, a football player, perhaps, or does it look like somebody who's a mathematician? Um, and uh, the sort of catch here is, that, is the answer is it's correct in both um, circumstances. So this is John Urschel, who um, at the time was uh, playing uh, center, I think, for the, the Baltimore Ravens and also pursuing a PhD in applied math at MIT. Um, he's since uh, quit professional football to focus on his PhD full time. I think he's expected to graduate uh, this spring or if not next year. Um, anyway, a really inspiring figure. Is, um, he's given a bunch of great interviews. He has some cool theorems as well. So um, anyway, so uh, I, you know, I try to signal, um, I, I try to signal uh, I try to, I guess the point of having a presentation like that at the beginning of the class is you're trying to sort of establish norms and then you have to try and live by those norms. And in this particular semester in fall 2016, I was really sort of challenged later on to see whether I could, you know, live up to the expectations I was trying to create for the class. So um, I guess the, I mean, the, the first incident happened the day of our second midterm, which was a Friday, November 4th. Um, it happened to coincide with the day of a Black Lives Matter protest on campus where they distributed, you know, t-shirts and everyone was instructed to wear the t-shirts all day. So the question was whether I should wear a Black Lives Matter t-shirt while proctoring a midterm for my classes. Um, I hadn't uh, made political statements um, in class previously. And of, of, of course, um, you know, I was worried about, uh, you know, alienating and offending uh, students who would feel attacked by, uh, or who, um, you know, solidarity with Black Lives Matter movement. Um, in the end, though, I decided that, uh, you know, of in, if I was comparing the population of the people who would feel supported by a gesture like that and the people who would feel alienated by a gesture like that, the people who would be supported um, were probably in a position where that support would be more beneficial. I, I felt like it was going to do more benefit than harm. And so I, I wore the shirt. I didn't comment on it the other day. But it was, I, I would say, I feel like I was able to connect sort of silently with my students, you know, some of my students um, were also wearing these Black Lives Matter shirts as they were turning in their exams to me. And there was this moment where we made eye contact. Again, these aren't students who I had an opportunity to know by name, but I felt like they 
felt like I was supporting them in this uh, sort of wordless gesture. Um, so that I was tested again uh, a few days later. So we <laughs> turned back the midterms on Monday, November 7th. Um, Monday, November 8th, 2016 is a date that many of us in the US remember. And um, you know, I was up till 2 AM reading the election returns and almost immediately got an email from my, one of my students saying, you know, he did not uh, want to come to class the next day. He was feeling unsafe. Did I give my permission to skip? Um, and he asked me if I would cancel class. And I, I wrote back to him and I said, well, certainly, you know, you're, you're, you don't, don't have to come to class. Please take care of yourself. There are more important things than learning mathematics. But, you know, I didn't feel like, uh, I didn't feel like canceling class was the correct thing for me to do. Um, and so then I get to campus that morning and I'm preparing my lecture about the line integral. And um, maybe uh, reckoning back to the first anecdote, um, when I was a participant at Matrix, I, I felt like if I'm, you know, on this day when students are feeling so many different things, expecting them to learn about the line integral, you know, this is the one lecture that they're going to see on the line integral, we're on to the next topic the next day, there's something else for the exam, then I'm really a part of the problem. I'm, you know, I'm adding to their burden of what they have to deal with today by, you know, making them responsible for my new content. So you know, my student was right, absolutely. You know, half an hour before class, I did cancel it and uh, showed up and um, talked about something called the wobbly table theorem, which is a fun little thing, um, just as a, as a distraction more than anything else. But certainly, this was not a, a part of the exam. Um, so um, all of this is to say, you know, um, you know I, didn't, I didn't discuss the election in any way. That was kind of my personal choice. But um, I think there are things that we can do even short of um, vocalizing uh, or hosting a political discussion to uh, try and ease the burden on our students. And I think it's really mindful that if you don't take those opportunities, even if you are just you know, teaching some mathematics, you can be increasing burden on students who you know, really need a little bit more support. Um, I'll stop there and turn it over to Christian, but thanks very much, Nina. I think, um, I th I think Nina's really embodied a, a correct response in saying, you know, sometimes carrying on and just doing more mathematics isn't the correct approach in my view. So um, I think this is a really admirable thing that you've done. Uh, th thank you. Um, I'm not nearly as prepared as, as the other presentations. So um, thank, thank you all for giving those. Those are really great. And um, I'm just really thankful to um, be a part of this community. Everybody that I've met so far has just been amazing. And um, I'm really uh, looking forward to um, building this community and making it stronger and more inclusive. And um, yeah, thank you, Nina, for putting this on today. Um, yeah, I mean, um, basically, uh, as you probably know, we started this server um, towards the beginning of the quarantine. And um, it really took off beyond uh, anything I could have imagined. And it has a, well over a 1000 people now. And, um, and I just think that um, I think that we don't even really know the potential of that sort of that level of connection. I, I think we really don't even know um, what that can do for our community. Um, and it, it's just this radical level of openness now that has never been seen in academia before. And um, and it all goes with what's so great about this community and the ideas that we think about um, that category theory itself is so fundamentally about openness and transparency and connection and um, you know universality and um, it it shows through in the ideals that that you find in the people that love it so much and um, and yeah so I um, I got a little bit intimidated and overwhelmed with with how much there is to be done with all this, uh, and so I haven't been working on it recently. But I, I've been wanting to um, make a lot of improvements, and I want to talk with you all about all the stuff that we could do with the server. Um, but 
but specifically about the aspect of inclusivity and that is such a vital uh, part of starting to to build this community um, the the improvements that I was thinking about first were about making it more about people uh, and not just the mathematics um, so I in terms of making the server more welcoming, uh, I would like to make a lot of structural improvements that make it much more focused on us and who we are and what we care about um, and how, um, why we care about category theory. Um, and there should be uh, channels for, you know, what are, what are our, dreams with this stuff um, how do we how do we want to help society with it and all of that but also the personal stuff about just what is it doesn't have to be about math at all just what is going on in your life and this is just a really crazy time and um, just trying to make it a more cohesive and um, embracing um, place um, but uh, so I, I'd like to talk about that aspect, but um, in light of uh, what we're talking about now and what's been going on, there's, there's a lot more we could do to make it proactively inclusive um, that, uh, that I haven't thought about as much in terms of um, outreach and recruiting people and bringing them in and having designated small groups for people to help each other and designating roles for um, for people to uh, to go out of their way and help each other and use personal messages and really get to know each other and um, have more face-to-face -face meetings and there's there's just so much that we could do and so um, I didn't I didn't really have anything prepared but um, but in addition to the other discussion at the end of this, um, it would be great to have a discussion about what we can do with the server and um, a continued discussion on the on the Zulip chat. And um, once um, my life is a little more normal in a few weeks, I would uh, love to get a team together and um, have like regular meetings about about improving the space, um, but yeah, that's it. Thank you, Christian, and uh, uh, yes, thank you also to the other speakers for participating today. This was all put together in less than two days across different time zones, so I really appreciate uh, everybody taking the time uh, to talk. Um, and so I would suggest maybe before we move on to Zulip, Maybe we could have some questions now, might be easier. Um, right, so I don't know, so if maybe, yes, people who have questions for any of the speakers, you could just unmute yourself and ask the question, and hopefully it will work. Uh, yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear? Okay. So I have a question to you, but also to the participants. First of all, I'm happy to see, my name is Stelios, nice to meet you all. Um, I'm happy to see the diversity uh, of this board. And in general, I'm happy to see that in, uh, when it comes to diversity in genders and, genders and sexual orientation, that we're doing, it looks like we're doing progress. But, um, I've been to so many conferences, not too many, but I haven't seen a single black participant. Many conferences in the US, right? So to my knowledge, this is a problem of uh, accessibility to higher education. And you personally, Nina, had some very powerful slides in the beginning uh, that uh, criticized in a way the stance of many senior mathematicians that they showed some distant stance. I'm afraid that I've seen in general uh, sort of distant stance from the academic community towards uh, protests or towards problems and towards uh, potential solutions to these problems. So you also said in that uh, slide, we should use our privilege. 
So my question is mainly directed to senior mathematicians. If there's any chance of, uh, in the wake of the, the killing of George Floyd and the huge protests right now that take place in the U.S., and I'm, I don't want to look like uh, look like I'm lecturing people on, for their country, out of American, so please don't take this as, a, as an aggressive remark. But I'm asking, uh, are people willing globally, as an entry community or mathematical community or even applied category category theory community? Uh, to put pressure, to maybe have some new legislation, like real pressure, tangible pressure, to make uh, academia more accessible to, to black people. Because I've been seeing so little of them. Uh, that's my question. So my question is, how, how, how far are people willing to push the envelope? How are people willing to, to go beyond just manifestos or beyond just a few... Um, organizing a few special occasions here and there if they will, to, to make some sort of more meaningful protests. So, well, uh, maybe I'll answer first and then if anybody else wants to. Well, I think some of these things, I agree with you that it's important to actually have long-term um, um, activities or engagement with this. And so I think that's part also of what I said. It's uh, well, first of all, it's a process. We first need to just educate ourselves and to have dialogue. There are, there are black mathematicians, it's just maybe we don't interact with them. And this is not only in the US, also in Oxford, there are almost no black mathematicians or students, um, for example, because I was yes, a student there and I, I could see there are just no black students. Um, and so I think, yes, it's, it's a process. Of course, we need to be willing to engage ourselves with this process, but then, for example, I think that, uh, so this example I gave of the Mathematical and Theoretical Biology Institute is, was very successful in uh, increasing the, the percentage of, I think, Latino students who would go from undergrad to getting a PhD and then actually getting tenure track positions. And so, but this was, uh, and this was done through, through mentorship uh, at different levels and, uh, and research programs and so on. So I think in that sense, this is a long-term plan and um, so, so in that sense, yes, I think that's part of what we're trying, I guess, to do today, to try to really use this momentum we have now to try to set up some initiatives. And then we just need to keep also the discussion uh, going. From the point of view of legislation and so on, I'm not sure, this was also somebody wrote in the comments earlier, well, these protests are about police violence. And uh, yes, it's true, but so I think that it's not just, it's a very complex issue, right? So this discrimination and racism, it, it is systemic, it's at all different levels of society. And, uh, and so what we can do, I think from our part, is really try to change these things from within and try to set up some structure that helps the students to actually, let's say, throughout their academic career and life. And then maybe we also want to make some statements about uh, less legislation and so on there. I, myself, I don't know enough about these things to be able to comment on that. Maybe somebody else would like to comment on that. Um, but I'll yes, thank in. you for the question. Um, sorry, I'll jump in real quick. Um, I thought uh, Jade's comment before was, uh, was really powerful that the, the meritocracy is, is broken. Um, if a lot of things that we consider as objective criteria, say for graduate admissions for my department um, would be, you know, prior success in graduate courses. But of course, only students who under attend certain types of undergraduate institutions, you have an opportunity to te take uh, graduate courses. And so we are um, immediately excluding the vast majority of applicants if we insist on something like that as our objective criteria. And um, I think, um, you know, part of the work that Nina was describing that we have to do if we are going to have some sort of admissions procedure, which I mean, it's necessary for us, we have um, a certain number of spots and we have no possibility of expanding them because of financial pressures imposed from above. Um, if we are going to have some, uh, some sort of selection procedure, um, we need to challenge ourselves to um, understand somebody's merit in different ways. So, so um, there's, there's not a uniform criterion you know, if everybody had the same life experiences, then perhaps, you know, a test or something like that could provide a uniform criterion, but that's just not the, the way the world works. So what excellence is going to look like in one background is, is different from what excellence looks like in another background, and we're being blind if we don't acknowledge that. Um, 
I think as uh, Stelos was suggesting, the, the broader issue is, is, is um, much bigger at the societal level, at the political level. Um, you know, in my, there in the US and in Maryland and Baltimore in particular, um, there are massive, massive, massive funding disparities uh, at the public school level. Um, our governor is getting some praise right now for his coronavirus response, but he has been starving the city of school funding for decades and to the point that there's not even heating in the winter necessarily. Um, of course, these aren't the schools in the rich white neighborhoods, these are the schools in the poor black neighborhoods. So I think absolutely we need to um, have some new legislation um, not just at the national level, though, a, a lot of the, the school issue is really a local issue or a state, state level issue. Um, yeah. One comment that I like to say is that I think we need to have more black people in leadership and organizational roles. Because um, otherwise, like, I think it would be bad to do lots of things to help black people without, or at least try to do lots of things to help black people without getting their input. Maybe if I can just comment quickly. Sorry, uh, sorry. If um, I can just comment. Go ahead. Yes. Just answer to Jade. I think yes, it's important. But there is something to observe also that uh, at the moment these uh, initiatives for Black students they are led by Black academics, so they are already doing all the work. And so in that sense, it's also I think it's important that we don't give them even more work. So in that sense, I think it's really important to involve them to have this dialogue. But I think we should also take on the burden to change some things. And of course, I think in terms of mentorship, it's really important to have black mathematicians mentor black students, but we should not, yes, give an e even more work to them to do. Uh, so we should try to make things as easy as possible for them to contribute. So, sorry, Stavis. As a quick answer to, no problem, to Jade. Uh, incentivization, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, apologies. I don't think it uh, can work on a global level. And I'm with Emily that tangible support must be shown toward changing the legislation, at least that's my impression, especially from leading senior academic voices. And that might mean taking people out of their comfort zones. I don't want to sound too partisan, but yeah, the funding issue uh, was one that I was largely covered by Emily's response. I'll just, maybe I'll just mention that in addition to legislation, which is of course quite difficult <coughs> to, it's, diff it's, it's hard to pass legislation, especially if you don't know a lot about politics, aren't a player in politics. Something that's pretty helpful to do and much easier for academics to do is to engage in programs where you invite students from local high schools to get involved in math programs at your at your college. Uh, both Emily and I live in places where there are lots of uh, minorities and lots of poor people who would, uh, some of whom would really benefit a lot from, from some uh, a door away into the academic world, which is something that they might consider impossible. Uh, so at UC Riverside, we do a fair amount of that kind of outreach. And then there's a second kind of outreach that's required where a lot of people who major in math at UC Riverside don't really know about the idea of graduate school because they come from backgrounds where none of their relatives have dreamed of going to graduate school or even know maybe that such a thing exists except in a very distant way. And so doing further uh, help for people who are already in your university to actually see what the possibilities are for further study of mathematics or whatever subject you, you're teaching. That's also can be very helpful. So we try to uh, get some of our undergraduates to go on to grad school at our own university or other universities would be fine too. Um, so those, those kind of things are, are much more within the comfort zone of academic and say trying to pass new legislation. But I think they're, it can be really useful. And so because they're within the comfort zone, there's things you can imagine doing and, and it's not so hard to do.
Are there any other questions that people would like to ask now? Yes. Um, at the University of Waterloo, where I studied in the 60s, early 70s, they had a way of screening applicants for the undergraduate program in which they would look at their high school grades. But they would then do statistical correlations between the incoming students' high school grades and how they subsequently performed the university in order to rate the high school. So if you did moderately well at a really terrible high school, you stood out like shining star. But if you did poorly at a really good school, you didn't. But um, I suggested that to admissions at another university I was working with later. And they told me it was illegal to do it there for privacy regulations. That's all. Uh, thank you. I don't know if anybody wants to comment or th on that or um, if anybody else has a question or remark. Well, I, just, I was just going to say that um, thanks everyone for, for putting this on. Um, there's a tutorial day at the ACT school. And, uh, It'll be July 5th, and it's the sort of thing that's open to everybody. Um, and so it's a, maybe a good opportunity to try some of these things. And we'll start from very basic uh, level. Um, but you mentioned trying to advertise outside of the standard things, Nina, like uh, outside of where we usually advertise. And I'm wondering if you have, or if anybody has ideas to how to reach this broader community for this event, which is kind of similar to something someone suggested of just, I think Josh suggested uh, like a CT boot camp. So this seems sort of like a possibility and I'm wondering if we can capitalize on it to really start with what you're talking about. Um, yes, yeah, so I don't have, so I, I guess, yes, it's or what I already said is I have some, for example, I, I know, um, Candice Price who is one of the four women behind the website Mathematically Gifted and Black. I have already contacted her two days ago to, to say that we would have this session and um, so my plan at the moment is really to reach out to people and ask, uh, for example I asked her for con other contacts and in that sense as I had said establish a dialogue and really yes through contacts of contacts just to get to people and spread the word. And yes, these were discussions we had already in the past, right? How do we reach out to people? But I guess now we would try to do it maybe in a more targeted way or really also invest more time because then again, we would just resort to the usual mailing list that we already know. Um, so I guess, yes, I think it's also a good suggestion to try to do this. This is soon, right? And so really capitalize on this momentum. And I think it's also, I feel also it's really important to, to do this also just because of the effect it might have on other communities, right? Because the more people stand up now to try to do these things, the more it will also motivate other communities to try to do, to do this. Um, David, I know some people who are, who run uh, kind of math camps for people who are at different levels uh, for black students who, who are very well in, in this way. And so I could tell you about them. They could help probably. Okay, thanks, John. Yeah, so if anybody has ideas, um, even if you don't think of them right now, please feel free to email me or um, anyone on the ACT organizing committee about it. Um, More generally, um, and I also want, David and I are sort of starting this, this applied category theory well, this institute that for for sort of fundamental research that contain, that sort of will carry out many of the themes discussed today, um, and in these in this discussion of more sort of structural change, um, I think what's important is also sort of uh, organizations that have the the capacity to carry out these programs and support them, um, and I hope Topos will become one of those organizations. And if you have ideas about how to interact with an organization like that, then please contact me or David um, and would love to incorporate those ideas. Um, I'll copy my email into the chat because I noticed I've been saying email me, but I'm not sure that everyone has my email. I think Paolo had a question. Yes, I have a question. Is there a black person in this conversation?
So one thing that we should all keep in mind is that whenever we want to talk about an underrepresented group or whatever kind of group, we should always involve them from the very start. It's very easy, it's very tempting to do something and feel good about it. And maybe it's not helping that much or maybe even backfiring. So let make sure that we involve whoever we want to help from the very, very, very start and we hear their voices first. I agree with that completely. Already... This, so, this, uh, just to let like people to... know, this was all planned out starting two days ago, I think. So. No, but sure. I would like I'm to not, say I'm something about anyone. this. Yeah, no, 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 sorry, I want... want to answer to this because I uh, yeah, no, I, I no, was no, about to no, say no, please. that. I want to say that what you said, what you say goes already in the right direction. So what you said is already, Really no, great. no, but I have thought hard about this uh, and I want to answer what my decision was. Uh, because, for example, as I said, I actually contacted the first person I contacted is Candice Price, who is one of the women behind the website, Mathematically Gifted and Black. And I mentioned that we were doing this today and if she could find somebody, and then she answered, uh, it's great that they're doing this. Can I get back to you in some days? Because it has been a really hard, um, has been really a rough couple of days. I need to practice some self care. And at that moment, I said, okay, I just need to leave this the way it is. And because this, I mean, I have also been reading, uh, we really need to, uh, we can't give even more burden to people who are already struggling at the moment. And so that was, it was also my decision to leave it there and just try to educate myself as much as I could, because um, I agree with you, we need to involve them. And as I said, I hope today is the start of the process. It's not, right, it's just the start. And it's a discussion that we need to have with them. But we can't now, just because now we are waking up and we're saying, oh, we need to do something, now also give them this burden. So it was really a, a decision I had taken and I was aware that probably today there will be no black mathematician present. I was aware of this. But uh, yes, but I think, as I said, I think it's a dialogue and it's a process. We need to do our work and we can't give our work to them to do for us. But yes, thank you. I think it's a very important point. Yes. Yeah, so I hope you don't, you know, don't feel this as a criticism. I just wanted no, no, to point no, out I think it's, it's easy to make this mistake. But as I, I said, I, what you I, said, what you said already uh, is, I mean, all the ideas you're you have proposed are, of course, extremely good. So. But yes, uh, no, I thank you for this. But I also think, because I hear this also from like, people that say that it's also easy to make the mistake that then we give them even more work. They also need to care for our peers, right? They, 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 they need to deal with our, with our emotional struggle at their problems, right? That's also, we don't need to burden them even more with problems or things to do. So, yeah. I think uh, the work thing, <clears throat> if, we, if we provide enough sort of incentives and, pay, incentives and payments and I guess sort of privileges um, as well as sort of these leadership roles, so make sure they're not just volunteer things, then I think we can sort of get both of these things happening, where people will actually want to work on these things because it will help them as well as help their community. If we make these uh, leadership roles and sort of, if we give sort of positions to people that are good enough, <laughs> then it's not a burden anymore. I also wanted to mention that um, the ACT uh, conference, we solicited donations, which Brendan talked about at some point. Um, and we got some from companies that some are involved in arms sales to the US government uh, and others. Um, and that's uh, an issue that we should discuss. And it's different from the, from the George Floyd and the inclusion issues um, may be related in some, dis in some kind of way. But regardless of that issue, which is important, there's also the fact that because it wasn't, we didn't have the conference uh, in person, we actually have a few thousand dollars left over that um, we can use for the ACT community. These, this was sponsorship from Protocol Labs in the Bay Area and many other um, companies, but the Protocol Labs in particular for, uh, which is not an arms dealer in any way for inclusivity. So, if people have suggestions and, and some of the, the, for how to use that money, um, it's just in a bank account right now. And it is for us and for exactly inclusion. So uh, I think Jade mentioned that money would help. Um, we're looking for ways to help with it. Again, uh, email me or, or ACT organizer if you have ideas or mention them now. 
if mm -hmm. I could interject one thing, just to add a, just a factual point is the, 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 the arms question is not so removed from the other issues we're discussing um, in the sense that if you look at what's been happening in the last week, week and a half, uh, what are, these police departments have tanks that are US military provided to them. And that's one of the things going on. And tear gas canisters, they have military grade weapons produced and procured by the US government and then provided to them by all these same arms companies and manufacturing firms. They're, there is not a distinction between the equipment that the police have been using to uh, suppress and uh, respond, shall we say, to these protests and uh, the equipment that is used uh, by the U.S. and other militaries uh, in other places in the world. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. But it's related. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, can I say something again about funding? Okay. Just go ahead. Yeah, John, John is not. Oh yeah. So uh, somebody, uh, Nina too, actually has had this idea of, uh, for example, not everybody had access to tablets and stuff like that, and she's absolutely right. Um, this idea also came to other people that are involved in the ACT school, uh, such as uh, Mike Schulman and so on. So part of the funding that David mentioned that was actually meant to make. Uh, the ACT conference and school was in, more inclusive. There's this inclusivity sponsor protocol labs that paid quite an amount of money to make this happen. Cannot be used for flying people to Boston because of Corona. So part of that money will actually be used to purchase graphic tablets and similar devices to the people of the ACT school so that during the research week, they will be able to interact remotely. And of course, it's not the same as an in-person week, but given the current circumstances, it's what works best for everyone. So that was not my idea. It's never been my idea, but I think it's been a great idea. And uh, apparently several people had it independently of each other. So I think uh, I'm, I'm very happy about this and I want to thank all these people who had these thoughts. I have a comment. Um, here's something that could make applied category theory more inclusive. What if we made a really good wiki that defines all the concepts very clearly? Um, if you don't know what a con, if you if you don't know what one of the terms is, you click on the link and it takes you to that. Like the NLAB is very inaccessible for a lot of people, unless you already know a lot about the stuff. And specifically, we can have the wiki be talking about um, what applications of category theory people are doing now, so that it isn't there isn't so much of a barrier to get into like if we're trying to do this whole open research thing and not care about like um, I don't know priority and just put all our research out there like why don't we start just making this this wiki together the wikiversity has a page on category theory it's not very good but it exists I'll mention I'll mention that uh, David Tanzer, who's the fellow who's running the Azimuth Wiki, a wiki that I helped start, has uh, just created a new wiki for the applied category theory community. Um, so far, there's nothing in it, and he, we haven't opened it up to the world yet because it needs a little bit of work. Uh, it differs from the, so the Azimuth Wiki allows for LaTeX, but not ticks. Uh, but the uh, this new wiki allows ticks as well, and so in a, in about a week or so, anyone who wants to start working on a wiki will have a wiki waiting there for them, especially for the applied category theory community. And there are all sorts of things you can imagine doing with that wiki, and luckily, you can do all of them. <laughs> If people have enough energy to do them, they, they can go ahead and start doing them. I just wanted to uh, make a comment that I think that it's uh, important not just to take a emotionally neutral stance when it comes to uh, diversity and inclusion. Uh, uh, I, I, I find uh, 
uh, diversity to be something profoundly um, beautiful. And, uh, you know, we, we need to uh, uh, kind of take a, a, a bit of a joyous attitude at, at the opportunities that we have to uh, uh, reach out to folks. I think uh, we should move over to Zulip, Nina. Um, yes, I guess so. So how are we going to, because we are, how many are we? We are 60, still left. So is this going to work? How is this going to work on Zulip? Maybe that's the question. Because then everybody, if everybody comments, then we have 60 comments. And I, I'm not really familiar with Zulip, so maybe. Well, well, we don't usually get all 60 people okay. suddenly wanting to comment on Zulip. I mean, if they suddenly want to comment, they should say something right now. I just, I mean, so I prefer, I'm only suggesting this because I thought that the conversation was, was done. Uh, um, I'm sorry, can I make a suggestion? It's, it seems that there are many things that we want to discuss, amongst them inclusivity and funding. These are already two, of course, related, but not the same issue. So, how about we create an entire stream about these topics like ethics, inclusivity, and so on, and then we can have inside there separate topics. So just like ACT at UCR, we put another one and we don't all write in the same thread as now. Because I what think should, that sounds like a great idea and, and, and what should extreme, it be called? Extremely easy to do. I don't know. Can we change what it's called <laughs> later? We yeah. can, right? Are, yeah, are you can. locked, locked yeah. in? So go ahead and make it. Why don't one of you make it? Yeah, I don't know what it's called. Ethics. It is. I don't know what to call it. It's. Uh, it should be broad enough that it can. We can fit lots of things in it. But I, I don't probably. If we can change the name, we don't have to optimize it. Values. Sure. Let's call it. Let's call it value, and and people can make lots of different uh, top topics in there for different things. And this could go on. This these conversations can go on for weeks, just like our conversations about algebraic K theory have been going on for weeks. I think there should be at least as much interest in ethics as in those more esoteric topics. So that's a great idea. Thanks, Christian. Um, um, if I could just maybe say, um, so I don't know if, how much this kind of relates to the, the dialogue of inclusivity as it's been discussed, um, I guess, during this session. But I think that, that uh, um, it's, it's probably like maybe worthwhile to keep in mind um, I guess like mathematics as a community um, versus other like scientific communities. Um, the discussion of, of inclusivity, I guess like, like, no. Uh, sorry. Um, I think, I think like, like math, as a community, as a discipline might have, I guess, particular difficulties or like, like a special, like, yeah, particular difficulties in to consider when talking about inclusivity as the, the subject itself is kind of, um, maybe difficult or intimidating. Um, and, and I guess like as a, as an outsider, from like and as, as an outsider to math myself, I think that's something that um, I think would be useful to, to kind of like keep in mind um, that, that inclusivity might also involve getting people outside of math into math as well. Um, that's, I, I, I hope that kind of made some sense. But. 
That makes a lot of sense to me, especially in the realm of applied category theory. We're always worrying about that kind of inclusivity. We, a bunch of us know category theory very well, and we're trying to figure out how to apply it. And sometimes we get into rather silly conversations where we sort of say like, oh, I wish I knew something to apply it to. I wish I knew somebody who like knew something that needed to be done. <laughs> uh, and, and, and then on the other hand, there are people who are be like beginning to hear about applied category theory who work in genetics, economics, linguistics, architecture, music, and they will ask me and other people questions like, so how can you apply category theory to these areas? Or they may have some rough idea of how they would like to do it. Uh, but it's a very difficult conversation because you can't very rapidly figure out how to apply category theory to, to anything. Actually, you have to, it, it takes either one person who knows both subjects pretty well, or a really serious conversation between two people. And a lot of times those conversations don't work in practice because they don't go on far enough to the point of finding the meeting ground where something really fruitful happens. Uh, so I've been spending a lot of time trying to learn chemistry and so on so that I can do some of these things myself, but I still wish I knew more and I wish I was more in more deep contact with people in those fields. So, so yeah, bringing in people from different subjects and also bringing in people from outside academia is really important for the success of applied category theory. Maybe to add something about this, this is also partly what uh, with what we are try also to address with this, the joint school. The idea is to bring in students from different types of backgrounds. Uh, yes. So yes, I agree. Yes, I also think it's a very important point. I'll just add that this short, that, well, that it takes a lot of time for these meetings of the mind to occur. And a lot of uh, programs where you have people in a fairly short time just don't quite seem to, to get the job done. I mean, so I'm not talking about that particular one, but I'm saying that we, we really need ways to get people talking to each other for long periods of time. So maybe small groups of people talking for a long time is much better than a big crowd of people talking for a week. About, so, uh, please go ahead. Okay, I will go ahead. Um, I read a study sometime in the past year on the uh, abilities of women and men specifically boys and girls in uh, scientific and technical subjects. And it was interesting because on the average, the conclusion was that the women were better than the men at it. But the men had much higher variance. So if you look, say, for the top 1%, you got men. If you look for the bottom 1%, you also got men. <laughs> That's all. Perhaps we should move over to Zulip. And in the meantime, I'll grab a cup of coffee. I think this has been a great conversation, a really good way to end the uh, spring ACT at UCR seminar, much more exciting. Well, I can't say it's more exciting than Nina's talk would have been, but hopefully I'll see her talk in a couple of weeks and then I'll be able to compare. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they'll both be exciting in different ways. What I meant is that this is much more exciting than, than like yet another uh, technical talk. Uh, I completely agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> it was your idea, so I assume you <laughs> think so, you agree. So, so thanks very much, Nina, for, for doing this and for organize, organizing people at the last minute. And I hope this is really just the beginning of, of a lot of things that go on longer. And I hope some of them go on on Zulip. Uh, we're 
it's really remarkable how much conversation is going on there. Uh, so I think just having a place to talk about these issues there, which we now are, which we now do, uh, will will make it happen. And it it'll take a while for it to really get rolling. But I hope hope even those of you who don't go to Zulip very often will at least like take a look at it now and then and see what's going on there. Um, can I can I ask a question? Um, so since Nina has been has given up her research talk slots, and since she's giving the same talk as I understand it in a couple of weeks in Oxford, can I ask her to say um, to give the details of that talk so we can all go if we want to? Just you know when and where it's you know where we find the link for it. Oh yes, I would first need to ask the organizers of that seminar because I think it's a local seminar. I'm not sure. I don't think it's that pub. Yes, it's. Um, let me first ask them, and then okay. I would send, let's say, an email, and maybe to John, and John can send it to everybody. That's. Okay. I, I would not feel comfortable now sharing the details with sure. us. Yeah, okay, thanks. Great. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, okay, so yes, I would also like to thank everybody for coming today, for for the, all the speakers who just yes uh, did yes prepared at the last minute and for coming. And yes, I would say let's move on to Zulip. Uh, maybe after a coffee break or for me. Uh, I'm just gonna break. run and grab a cup of coffee and then come back here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, then. Okay. Bye. Bye.